Uh, we'll go. Great. I am really happy to bring Christy DePaul today, uh, and who is a MAM alum and who I'm going to give the floor to right now. You can share the screen, put it in speaker mode or, uh, so that we can get that nice big picture of you in front of us. And uh, we're looking forward to you joining us today. We would normally applaud wildly. And in fact, the applause would still not be ending, still not be ending. Maybe just now it would be ready for you. Wow. Um, well, thank you so much. I, that, I I appreciate that so much, Jessica. I'm, I'm super excited to be here talking to everyone today. Um, where I am in the world, it's actually 6 p.m. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, later in the day. And interestingly, I am a Pittsburgh native. So um, all of you right now, if depending on where you are, if you're in Pittsburgh, then you're close to my old stomping grounds. Um, so when Jessica invited me to give this talk, I was really excited about it, knowing the sort of tense job market that many of the second years will be entering right now, as well as the competition for internships and just trying to figure out this whole virtual networking thing. It's, it's a lot. So I'll tell you a little bit about me and then we will dive right into all the really important applicable tips for all of you. Okay, so welcome to the world of remote work. Um, as, as we are chatting right now, I'm just south of Tel Aviv, Israel. Um, I am someone who has been working remotely for seven years and I'm excited that you're here, even though this is, has been the year that has been probably the most challenging for all of us. Um, and that's, that's saying quite a lot. So despite this being a tough time, and if you're new to this, you really have had the rockiest of starts in terms of remote learning, I do want you to think about the silver lining that access to all sorts of opportunities at this point have been democratized. You're able to communicate with all kinds of people. Um, of course, we could do that before, right? During the advent of the internet. But now that everybody has been forced online, um, if you will, a whole range of activities as well have gone online. So you have a lot of opportunities to network with people that you might never would have had um, in the past. So why listen to me anyhow? Already mentioned that I've worked remotely forever. Um, I, I do run my own firm now. It's called Founders Marketing. And we work with organizations that are largely in the nonprofit space, um, although we do engage with some startups. And we support organizations that are focused on the future of learning and the future of work, which is an interesting space to be in. My first Brady Bunch style interview with all the photos and people's names um, that I was trying to remember as I answered questions, that was back in 2014, and it feels like a lifetime ago now. I've written a lot of articles about remote work. I was pretty jazzed about it, frankly, five years ago before it was a really big thing. Um, literally anything that you've read in the past couple of years, I, I've probably written about it earlier, and I'm happy to answer questions that anyone has. Uh, in terms of my professional past, I've led marketing for startups, as well as for um, universities. I worked at Carnegie Mellon for almost three years in the School of Music. So that was sort of my MAM gig that um, shifted to a lot of other uh, interesting opportunities. Um, I've led, let's see, I, I'm a regular contributor to Harvard Business Review. So the Ascend column is for Gen Z and for millennials. No, I'm not on TikTok. So I think somebody here was mentioning TikTok uh, before. And I have built my fully remote company, which spans 10 time zones. So I've got a teammate on the West Coast, and then I'm all the way over here um, in 2015. And we've grown every year since, even during the pandemic, even after um, having a baby and all sorts of other fun and interesting life changes. So it is competitive out there. That's something that I want to make known to everyone here that yes, this is a very tough time. It's a difficult landscape. There are lots of people who are laid off um, or underemployed in the market. You have AI scanning resumes in the initial application stages. So you might feel that, okay, I didn't include the right keywords and now I'm not even being included um, in, in the candidate pool. 
And also, of course, it's an increasingly noisy and interconnected world. And in fact, as I'm saying the word noisy, I don't know if you can hear my toddler daughter just off of a stage right for me. Um, but it's a time where it feels like, okay, how can I even begin to stand out? So I just wanted to start there by acknowledge, acknowledging some of the challenges. And um, Jessica, I'm not sure if you're able to put everyone on mute, but since I'm on my speaker view, if you're able to do that, that would be helpful. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so first things first, I would love for you to change your mindset this is, I think this is the hardest thing to do when you are still in a program, no matter how much professional experience you have um, beforehand or not, um, know that you have so much to offer your future employer. I know you can feel, it can often feel as if you are sort of at the whims of someone who's willing to give you a job. And depending on a whole range of um, challenges in your personal life, that you might feel a little bit more desperate to accept something um, immediately, but I want you to first understand what an asset you are coming out of the Heinz College into the workforce. The things that you've learned here are transferable to so many different scenarios and so many different industries, frankly, that I, if you can internalize that prior to even launching your search, or if you're in the middle of it right now, I really want you to emphasize that to yourself. That said, you've got to be strategic and also pragmatic looking at the kinds of jobs that you want to do. And we will dive into so many specifics about job searches. So I won't uh, get too deep into that at the moment. Know that, of course, you're interviewing the any firm as much as they're interviewing you. Um, and potentially you do have other options in the short term. So part-time work, contract work, there are things that you can pick up in the meantime. Uh, last but not least, I think this is an important one. Your career won't be linear, I'll bet on it. Uh, a lot of us, I think back in the day, right? We thought that there was like a ladder and we would climb it. And I know coming from out of the MAM program that it's not quite that way because we didn't have uh, such a corporate focus. But in this day and age, the job landscape, it's more like being in a jungle gym. You're not going to be, likely, you're not going to be going from like associate to senior associate to, you know, advancing up a certain uh, ladder, if you will. So first things first, figuring out what do you really want to do, not just landing a job to land a job. Um, if you've done this work already, I applaud you. Feel free to tune out for uh, this slide. But if not, Please stay tuned. List one or two things that you absolutely love to do. So for me, this would be writing. I love to write. It's something that I hit flow state. Um, when people talk about flow state, you're not even thinking anymore. It's just, it's natural for you and it's wonderful. I would love to say that I hit flow state when doing public speaking, but it's, it's not a thing that does not happen for me. Um, so it's okay if you only have one, but consider that sort of your bedrock skill or set of skills that you want to use um, as you look at your job prospects. Then think about three to four industries that appeal to you. So I know um, in our program in particular, the MAM program, we were looking at, at least when I studied, the visual arts or the performing arts. And sometimes people would also head into higher education. Some wound up working for the private sector probably few, far fewer, and then also in government. So consider the industries that are going to be interesting for you as well as the org type. And I'll add this note, what works well with your personality type and your preferred lifestyle? So for me, part of the uh, interest in remote work was the flexibility that it afforded. Um, long before I was a mom, I was not a morning person that has since changed, but I did not necessarily want to work um, eight to five. And so have found ways even prior to founding my own company um, to be able to work on a schedule that I preferred. So think about the things that really matter to you in terms of your um, preferred lifestyle. And I think it would be remiss to not acknowledge your challenges, um, the potential challenges that you might have. 
So it could be a lack of relevant work experience. If you're um, someone who's coming straight out of undergrad into your grad program, you might only have internships and aside from like the one mall gig that you did. Uh, you might have little idea how to market yourself. Maybe you don't feel comfortable with that. And there's an awful lot going on in your life anyhow. So to think about how do I position myself, it just seems really daunting. You might also have a lot of very real obligations. You could have parents you need to help or you might have other relatives, spouse, kids, um, a whole bunch of people who could be counting on you. And then last but not least, I'm of course not here to be your money manager, but you could have financial constraints. So one of the things, of course, you should keep in mind is knowing how much runway you have before you have to um, essentially really panic about your job search and also considering how, what you can sacrifice on the way there. So if you're not landing your dream job straight away, can you pick up some contract work? Um, can you find an interesting part-time job that will help you land something, uh, an ideal full-time role, maybe six months down the road? Know how much runway you have, and then you'll feel more confident as you're approaching your job search. So this is a fun part, um, positioning yourself. You have been a remote learner, and I applaud all of you because this is not something that I had to do. And everybody here has done it in a hurry, um, including the folks who are running these programs. And I know that it has weighed heavily on everybody involved. So because you have done this, you, I am fully confident that you can become a remote worker. All of the transferable skills that you've gotten in your respective programs, um, remote delegation, collaboration, problem solving, uh, communicating both synchronously and asynchronously, everything from a distance. All of those critical skill sets are things that companies definitely take into account and really look for in remote candidates, um, my own included. So when you're considering how to write about yourself, we will go through the cover letter um, a little bit later and some other pieces with virtual networking. Know that you have the skill sets in your quiver already um, that are really valuable to the remote workforce at large. And of course, think about the tools and platforms that are useful um, in your respective industries uh, or the roles that you're seeking to fill. So if you have to build up tech expertise, now is a great time to do it. There are plenty of ways to figure out what um, professionals in your field are using. So in terms of tools, they, there are plenty of blog posts out there about um, remote work in particular. Uh, and there are a number of companies that I could just name, Buffer, Help Scout, Doist, they all sort of in a very meta way, they blog about remote work and the tools needed for it. But there might be specialized ones um, depending on your industry. And there's also desired characteristics. So you've got to be proactive. I, I say that you, even if you're someone who's naturally a little more passive, you need to have a certain level of tenacity to be a successful remote worker. You have to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. You have to over communicate. Um, and the reason you need to over communicate is because not everything, it, it's, you lose some context, of course, when you're not always um, discussing projects synchronously. So those characteristics are things that you've been honing over the past year. But really think about like what, what is going to stand out to a, a hiring manager? What kind of things have I already done or what characteristics do I embody that could be um, seen as an advantage? That said, and I, I will harp on LinkedIn a fair amount on this uh, in this presentation. Don't underestimate the power of LinkedIn. It used to be a destination for a static resume where people just showed off their best self in the third person. And now it's, I think it's a much more powerful and influential platform. I've used it to grow my professional network. You can find job announcements and referrals there. You've got to get professional references if you don't have those already on your profiles. I think it's extremely worthwhile, it builds credibility. Um, you can see who your peripheral colleagues are. So your network isn't just your network, it's also those who know folks that you know. So think back, uh, I think quite a few years ago, there was something called the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. 
you have that in your LinkedIn profile. Um, and also there's the possibility of connecting with a lot of new contacts. Um, on the social capital front, you can build relationships. And I don't mean like by spamming people with messages. So I will show you some genuine ways that you can do that on the platform. And that can lead to a lot of opportunities. Um, a lot of people think that if you make a new contact, you know, that has to lead somewhere. But I found that sometimes the contacts you make um, on LinkedIn and slowly by building relationships and interacting with people there, it can lead to opportunities that you never would have thought of. They might spot something in their network that they refer to you, or you might be able to help someone else with something. And while everything doesn't have to be quid pro quo, um, you find ways to create these relationships that are really both give and take. And last but not least, it enables goodwill within your network, which is always a positive thing. Oh, so here's, here's mine. I forgot that I put mine in here. Um, yeah, so the, the looking for work banner, I would actually advise you to hold off on putting that there. I think that there are a lot of people who have that banner present in their photo. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it would appear right where like my uh, headshot is here. Um, instead, figure out who's hiring and what they're looking for. Polish up your headline. Um, you see my headline here doesn't necessarily say CEO founders marketing. There are a few reasons for that. One of them is to avoid people spamming me because if you put CEO in your headline, you will get spammed. Um, the other is that I'm a whole lot more things than just that. And, and to say that I'm the CEO of this company doesn't really tell you what I do. So here I talk about future of learning and work, SME is subject matter expert, um, HBR contributor, et cetera, et cetera. I say no car selfies, and I say that to you um, with all the care and love that I have for Heinz alums. Uh, this photo is actually a selfie, so I'm not against those. I've had professional shots before, and, and there's something maybe about this past year that that feels a little bit too polished or a little bit too over the top. So I went with the selfie. Um, but in the car, it's just obvious, you know, you're wearing a seatbelt, it's just silly. Uh, Write your profile in first person. A lot of people will write it in third and it's, it shouldn't really be read that way. You want people to look at you and kind of imagine what it's like to talk to you. So being conversational, sharing your story in your summary section is really important. That's a way to draw people in and give them a sense of who you are and what makes you, I don't wanna say unique, but really what, what is special about you and there are only so many ways that you're able to do that in this medium. Yeah, and the last point is don't write, I'm a blank blank with a demonstra demonstrated history of XYZ because that is the definition of the lack of creativity. And I apologize to anyone on this call who has that there right now because that, at one point that was a best practice on LinkedIn to save a demonstrated history of something. But please don't, um, much better to show it. So things that you can highlight, if you've written articles or posts that are thought provoking that you feel strongly about, or if they've performed well or a combination of those, here are a couple of mine um, articles from HBR that really resonated with people. You should add a, an original description for every role that you have. Um, I don't care how minor it was or how it sort of felt like it was uh, less of a leadership role than you would have preferred. I, I think that there's a way that you can make it sound meaningful and definitely do not copy and paste from a list of responsibilities. Talk about the impact that you had instead, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. Um, it might be that you're able to talk about increasing ticket sales or um, streamlining processes and you might be able to throw percentages out there. Uh, but if you can't, you can still talk about what you've done in a way to improve the, the current situation in your department or to add value. So I don't want you to feel as if you always have to have some numerical figure to go along with everything that you've done. Um, because I've found also quite frankly that some of the most important things I've done in my work have been qualitative rather than quantitative. Last but not least, uh, I hope that you all have, recommend, have requested recommendations from others. 
and that you've endorsed other people too. I think that this is a way to build um, a lot of cred credibility. Having third-party testimonials on your LinkedIn is really helpful when other people check you out. And I will, I will add also that it's something you can, you can add to your resume. So think about this. If your former boss or even a colleague recommends you and has something to say that's really pretty cool. That doesn't have to just live on your LinkedIn profile. Um, I've taken chunks of quotes and put those on my resume. I haven't had to use my resume since I have my own company for a number of years, but that was always something that sort of broke the ice with um, hiring managers. They would tell me, oh, that's really neat. I didn't, you know, I've not seen a resume like this. Okay, let's talk about building your virtual network. So fun. Um, first of all, if you're not following prominent leaders on LinkedIn and Twitter, please consider doing that. And by prominent leaders, I mean a very broad and diverse group of people. Um, here's just a sample list of all the kinds of folks you could be following. These are people who give you ideas about what's happening in your field, help you stay on the pulse of what's changing, um, critical issues that are being debated and discussed. If you feel like you're disconnected, it can really help to bring you into a community. Sometimes you can find whole communities of people discussing things on Twitter, for example, around a certain hashtag. For me, I look at marketing Twitter a lot. So this is something that no matter where I am in the world, like right now, clearly I'm in Israel, I don't feel like I'm so far removed from anybody else. I'm still part of the conversation. Um, I might not be able to join in all the time synchronously, but I'm able to keep tabs on what is happening. And I, I'll say this, if you're not just following people, but you want to reach out, do send connection requests with context. We will add more to that in this presentation. Um, and there's that message again, always try to give before you get. So a lot of people reach out and ask for a favor or ask for something. Um, for me, people have said, hey, how can I write for HBR? Well, let me just, let me give you the how to, you know, so, try to talk to people and level with them. They're busy. They're just like you. They're busy. They have a lot on their minds and they're not necessarily open to being asked for a favor straight out of the gate. So if you're going to do that, you have to do it really strategically. This is for the introverts out there. Um, if you're out there, I feel like I'm an extrovert with introvert tendencies. I don't know, I need to, after this talk, I'm probably gonna go be alone in, the, in a dark space and just recharge. Uh, know that you are not alone. And in fact, there are many advantages for you. Um, there are whole books written about the advantages of being an introvert. And some of the most influential people in history have been um, self-proclaimed introverts. I think Albert Einstein was one of them. So whenever you can group yourself with Albert Einstein, I think you need to feel good about it. Considering the fact that you have a lot of low stakes options, there are a lot of ways to sort of dip your toes in the pool of virtual networking, whether it's attending a remote conference, there are quite a few that are also free. So if the cost is a consideration, that's another really helpful piece for you. And then there are Twitter chats, like I mentioned before, you can dive in and not feel like you're standing in a room full of people and you don't know anyone and you have to make conversation with an absolute stranger. So I, I actually feel much more comfortable um, interacting with strangers online. And just remember your superpowers. You're curious, you reflect, and you have great listening skills. And in this day and age, having great listening skills is pretty rare. And I think it's a very valuable, um, very valuable skill to have. So let's talk about finding remote jobs, searching like a pro. Uh, I know a lot of people who have sent out resumes to dozens of uh, companies. They'll go on LinkedIn or they'll find jobs through some other means, indeed.com, something like this, and just send their resume out all different places and not really bother to customize it. So what I, tell them, and I'll say the same to you, spray and pray isn't a strategy. You've got to filter and 
be very strategic and ruthless according to what your skill set is and aim for organizations where you've made a contact already, where you've met somebody. If an organization is on your radar, this is playing the long game, my friends. You should be following that organization on social media, um, LinkedIn and Twitter are where I go, but certainly you can follow them on TikTok if they have an account there. And figure out what's happening with them and find ways to start conversations with the people who work in the departments that are of interest to you. That's one way that you can avoid the numbers game because otherwise you're sending out dozens of applications with very little context. You're not standing out at all because you're just another resume in a sea of resumes. Um, right now, of course, it's a, it's a great hiring market for employers. They get hundreds to thousands of applicants per role, but how are you going to stand out? And that's not to say that just because you know someone, they're going to take your resume and plop it on the top of the virtual stack, but it certainly helps for you to have some sort of context and for them to be aware of you if they are in fact the hiring manager and for you to be able to, to communicate that interest. And I, the last thing I want is for any of you to get discouraged or burnt out because having confidence in your job search is so important that you really have to be careful not to let yourself get to that point. I've got a, uh, another key point here in the form of a, an image from HBR that too many people think they have to meet every qualification in order to apply for a job. And please know that that is not the case. So if you were aiming kind of low, let's just say you were trying to be cautious or find the things that are a sure thing and you're applying for coordinator jobs, consider something that maybe is, is requiring more experience than you have a little bit. It's okay. You don't have to apply for the C-suite, but maybe you could be a manager. So think about setting your sights a little bit higher. The worst thing that you can hear is no, and that's okay. I can tell you from running my own company that after a certain amount of time, uh, you do become maybe not numb to rejection, but you sort of look at it as if it's a bit of a sport. Like, well, maybe I can land this. Let's give this a try instead of facing it with some sort of trepidation. So aim a little bit higher than you might have aimed and don't feel that you have to meet every single qualification. Finding remote jobs, um, part two. There's going to be a part three as well. So. Uh, about specificity. Think about the key terms that matter for the roles you'd like to land rather than the names or the titles of the roles themselves. So instead of searching for a fundraising manager or you know, a customer service manager, which may or may yield some results or quite a few results, consider the key terms that would be useful in those roles uh, because a lot of organizations will use all kinds of titles, right? Happiness hero, what does that even mean? Um, you're, you can't search for that necessarily. So I don't want you to get stuck in a situation where you've got lists and lists of jobs, but you're missing out on some, some that would be an excellent fit for your specific skill set. So take the key terms that matter to you, um, whether it's marketing, fundraising, um, sales, public policy, variations of these and search for I'm hiring or now hiring on LinkedIn. A lot of people will put that in their profiles themselves and you will be able to see um, executives and hiring managers who have basically opened themselves up to show the world that they are hiring. And it's, it's kind of fair game if you'd like to send them um, an invitation to connect. Same thing goes on Twitter. Uh, if you're not on Twitter right now, that's fine join it and follow some people. So uh, some folks I know who are a little bit uh, skeptical about Twitter or late to the party um, join. And then they say, wait a minute, why is no one following me? And I'm like, well, you know, you have to follow some people first. You can't like, what is this? You can't just show up and follow no one. You're not, you know, um, you're not famous usually. Then look at job postings as a next step. So really social media first, then look at formal job postings. I advise that you should avoid mainstream sites. Um, consider that 
there are a range of uh, unique sites that are geared toward remote work. Flex Jobs, remote.co are two of them, also remotive. And then there are a range of companies as well. Um, Buffer is one, Help Scout, Automatic, that are fully remote and have been since their inception. And then there are specialty sites, again, like we work remotely. AngelList is great if you're either an entrepreneur or you would like to work for startups. And even for the mams in the house, there are plenty of uh, arts-focused startups in the world. So I don't want you to discount that as a possible opportunity. Okay, preparing your materials. I recommend that you have a spreadsheet that will help you keep track of your applications. This is for two purposes. One, it cuts down on the number of applications you actually send out because you have to update that spreadsheet, um, which is good because it avoids, it helps you avoid that spray and pray situation. You should have an updated resume, a cover letter that's fresh and non-formulaic. You can have multiple versions or different paragraphs that you can swap in and out, um, but you should be ideally uh, customizing these for each role. You should update your LinkedIn profile. You should also consider having profiles on AngelList or Product Hunt if you're um, an entrepreneur or if you're leaning that way. Uh, you can have a fancy spreadsheet if you want, but I would just, I think a basic one is all that I would advocate for. I think that's the most important. I've listed here the things that you should put on it so that you can keep track of when you applied, so you know when you need to follow up and also like when you need to move on. And you can set a goal for yourself of sending out X number of applications per month. I found that that's helpful. Otherwise, the job search can feel as if it's this never ending quest and you, you're just, it takes over your mind. So if you send out a certain amount and you're done, great. And you can send out more that month if you want. But otherwise, you, you fill your personal quota that you set for yourself and you can move on. Okay, the hidden job market. This is, tapping into this is not easy, but it really has to do with human connection. So one, the first piece is making your wishes known. Let people know what you're looking for. Again, kind of lean back from mentioning specific roles and talk about the key aspects of a job that you're excited about, the thing that sort of, that gets you really excited. Make your wishes known socially among your friends, um, on social media for sure. You don't have to sort of tell everybody, I'm looking for this particular kind of job, but letting people know that you're starting your search and you're excited about it and you're looking for to fulfill a role in this sort, sort of area and to accomplish these sorts of things. That's something that you can do more than once as long as you're creative about it. You can have multiple posts that sort of talk about your career journey, depending on how much you want to uh, live that out loud. I think it's very, it's very brave and it's something that people are drawn to your vulnerability online. So nobody wants to see, um, everyone is doing great and there's never any challenges. You know, I think the people who are making the biggest impact on social media are those who are bringing their whole selves and talking about their challenges as well as their victories. The second step is activating your network. These are the people who are already in your corner Again, whether those are our friends, family, um, past colleagues, classmates, your, co uh, your cohort in your program, uh, educators as well, program directors, all these people are interested in your success. So letting them know what's going on and, and what you're looking to do. Sharing and engaging with others in conversation online. You will hear me harp about this a lot. It definitely requires effort and you need to be proactive, but that's something that can really move you forward. Scouring some off the beaten path sources. So this one, one example would be, I want to work for, let's say I wanna work for um, a, a startup that's doing a lot of good in a different region. So there, there's an organization called Imaginable Futures 
Um, and they have a huge network of startups, but you have to sort of go down a rabbit hole on their website to find the jobs. So there are a number of organizations like that. Consider also venture capital um, firms. They have massive portfolios uh, and those companies are often hiring. So I'm talking a lot about startups, but there are a lot of places where finding a job isn't quite just, you know, looking on indeed.com. You have to do a little bit of digging and that's absolutely fine. Um, then the next piece that I think is really important and I will say this, you really need to like get out of your own head. You need to make sure that you're focused on your own success and don't be worried about what everybody else, like their, their opinions of what you're doing or so-and-so got this offer, this person landed their internship. I don't know what I'm doing yet. That's okay. Be comfortable in the fact that you have to, that you're continuing your search and getting the word out as in any way possible that you can, um, I think is helpful. Could be as simple as you saying, you know what? I am really fascinated by, I'm fascinated by, uh, let's say the live music industry. And I know that there are a number of podcasts and I, I think that I might be able to jump onto one of these podcasts and have a conversation about this. That would be fantastic for you. It's a great way to build your visibility. And by the way, it invites offers um, coming your way or the very least connections. So making a connection, everybody's had to do this with their, uh, with their classmates so far, if you weren't face-to-face -face, uh, in your first year. I still have a few pro tips. So you're trying to do it with absolute strangers online. Oh my gosh. This is terrifying. Um, I've made plenty of mistakes with this, plenty. I've taken, I, I've taken my own advice and then I've not taken it. So understand that I'm giving this advice to you uh, with my own failures baked in. You do have more access to experts and leaders now and you can send people an invitation request on LinkedIn and elsewhere. Um, add context always. I, I wrote this article for HBR about reaching out to people. I asked at experts, people who are way better connected than I am, people who you know, have millions of followers and are maybe not famous, but editors for the New York Times. And the things they were telling me were that you need to respect other people's time. So don't make assumptions that they're out, right out of the gate, they're going to help you. But if you're really direct and specific, so not saying, hey, can I pick your brain over coffee? Because nobody has time to have their brain picked. And if, if somebody wants to have their brain picked, they will send you a consulting bill or they should. So be direct and say, I'm, I, I see that you have a role in X or you're working at this organization in this kind of role that's really interesting to me. Um, could you give me a couple of pieces of advice in my job search? Uh, what traits might an organization like yours or a team like yours be looking for? People love giving advice. It's, it makes them feel good. They feel like they're giving back. And also, I suppose that also builds their ego a little bit. So frame your request as a request for advice and not a coffee invitation that could take a half an hour of their time. And you'll be surprised. A lot of people will um, respond positively to that. Okay, a couple notes about your resume. Uh, don't fret about length. I hope I'm not uh, contradicting what Career Services has told you, um, but it's okay if your resume is two pages, three pages. Please do try to be succinct. This is not, you know, it's not a competition to make it as long as possible. And presumably you're not in the academic space. So you don't need to have a CV that is miles long, but it's all right if you've got experience under your belt that you want to include. I would have two versions, one that's a bit plainer in Microsoft Word if you are applying to jobs uh, through hiring systems and you want to make sure that uh, they're able to read those systems that use AI are able to scan keywords if that's important. So 
have two versions, one in Microsoft Word, and then one that's a little bit fancier. The uh, options here are from Canva, which if you haven't heard about it, is a fabulous and free design tool that is browser-based. And we even use it for a lot of our client work. So there are templates there that you can use and they have so many that likely will not look formulaic to hiring managers. You can always alter the colors a little bit and change the fonts. Um, please no Comic Sans, unless you're, you know, kind of going for a funny role. Uh, and emphasize again, your impact, whether that's quantitative or qualitative, always. Don't just talk about what you did, talk about what you were able to achieve and how you really helped. I hate this phrase, so I'm sorry I'm saying it, but how you helped move the needle forward. Like what progress did you help your past team or department make? Some notes about your cover letter. Don't, don't be formulaic. Uh, I think most hiring managers, probably their eyes glaze over after they start reading the same sentences over and over just with like the names changed and the experience changed. So customize each one, make sure the design complements your resume. I didn't include my joke about Comic Sans in here. Uh, important point, and this definitely comes from uh, my professional existence and expertise as a writer, the job of each sentence is to move the reader to the next one. So hook them with the lead and keep on going. Don't drone on, make sure that every sentence you use really counts in this cover letter uh, because it's, it's a great way to speak to your experience. Always find the hiring manager. So I, I think I've found that when applying, if you can't figure out who you're addressing it to, that's uh, kind of a red flag. It's very difficult to feel like you're making a personal connection with to whom it may concern. And you usually can figure it out. Uh, sound interested? This seems like such a no-brainer, but so many people write cover letters that don't sound like themselves. And it's as if they're not, you, you've got to read it and make sure it's in your voice. So that's all part of the say goodbye to these boring templates. Those are just, consider a template like as if it is lorem ipsum text. Make sure it sounds like you. And the last point, proofread. I found that the best way to proofread is to start at the bottom. So go with your last paragraph and read backwards. It's the easiest way to catch your own mistakes. Applying and waiting. Here we are um, in that limbo. You're updating your spreadsheets. You're reaching out to people. You send follow-up notes. Um, just one if you were, let's say, invited for an interview, and then you move on if you're not selected. And sometimes people won't let you know. And I also agree that, that is, that's not very nice. They should be able to let everybody know within a certain window um, and not a very long window. I don't think that companies need to hire somebody and then send you a blanket rejection email. Certainly, if you didn't make it to the next stage, it's time to let you know. But that's another talk for another day. Your social presence. I've got a little bit more to say about this and I know we wanna open things up for questions. And you'll have this uh, recording after uh, the webinar ends as well to be able to reference it. So building up your connections, becoming more active on the platform. You guys are busy, you're grad students, but you can take some time using various tools to curate relevant articles, research from around the web, setting up Google alerts, posting about your own journey, um, using a tool like Buffer, I swear that I don't own stock in them. It's not possible to, um, but we do use them a lot and it's very helpful to be able to schedule posts in advance. Sharing things that resonated with you, adding something personal always. You can share other people's uh, posts and tweets as well, engaging people in conversation. Here's the piece about curating. So the Google alerts, that's so helpful. Um, you can set them up for anything that matters to you and then be fed a constant stream of information that then you can share and act on if you'd like. Uh, you can also make a commitment to check out a few trade publications or podcasts that are relevant for your field. And I found that if there's anything I want to get done, I've got to put it in a calendar block. So I actually wind up doing it. Posting about your journey, here are some ideas. 
um, if you're not sure what to write, personal challenges, your group projects, commenting on industry news. You do have fresh perspectives as people who are um, in higher education, you're studying now and it, you don't have to be part of the workforce to be able to um, share your commentary. Thinking about superlatives. So overcoming your biggest phobia, maybe it's public speaking. Um, what you love most about the prospect of working remotely. There's a lot of things that you can talk about. Advice that you can share, because I'm sure everybody on this webinar um, or listening to it has a range of advice that they could offer all of us. I'm talking about your failures as well. So I mentioned before, vulnerability wins. And here's more tactical uh, detail about what to do tagging the author and publication. So don't just share, but give people a heads up that you're sharing their content. Uh, I know as a writer myself, I love it when somebody lets me know that something I wrote helped them. Um, I don't know that though, if you don't tag me, it's not something that I'm just randomly searching for the titles of things that I've written. So that's a great way to connect with people as well who are sharing content. I've got notes here about cadence, depending on platform. Uh, I did not include TikTok, and I feel like I should have. And engaging others in conversation. Here's a list of ideas, all sorts of things you can do. Responding meaningfully, posing open-ended questions, uh, writing an article or blog post, or if writing isn't your jam, maybe you could make a video. You could record a Zoom call. One of the things that we're doing with clients right now, actually, is creating uh, branded videos from Zoom interviews that they're doing with people in the industry. So there's nothing stopping you from doing that. And it would still be cool to share, even though it's a recorded Zoom, I promise you. Okay, we've landed the interview. Uh, We're almost done with the presentation. So hooray, you have an interview. Uh, some obvious things here, read about the role in company, do some digging, view interview the interviewers, uh, social media profiles, Try to figure out what questions will be asked. Know thy stories, I say. Know how you're going to respond in a way that is personal um, and prepare your own smart queries for the end. What will you ask them? I had a head of talent acquisition say to me, you know, people have this opportunity at the end of an interview at the conclusion to literally ask me anything. I'm a captive audience and I am working at this company that they'd like to be a part of. And do you know how often they take advantage of that? Maybe 10 to 15% of the time. So you could flip that statistic and you could be someone who's asking those smart questions um, outside of, hey, how long is this gonna take? When are you guys gonna make a decision? You know, you can ask anything. Some more, um, some tips on managing nerves and expectations. The eating a banana piece, I learned this from a percussionist in the School of Music who he would always eat a banana roughly an hour before his auditions. Bananas have natural beta blockers, fun fact. So before any high stakes conversation, I do try to eat a banana, it helps. Um, in addition to the other prep notes of preparation. So role playing with a friend, uh, or going to mock interviews that the Heinz College sponsors. Those are all great things. Having your clothes figured out, your hair, very helpful, and the banana. Also tell yourself, like, not everything is riding on this one thing. If this falls through, if I bomb this interview and I am horrible, there will be something else. I'm not trying to give you that old adage of like, when one door closes, another door opens. But just know there are lots of doors everywhere. Um, there's been some research done uh, by Professor Amy Cuddy. She um, was fr from Harvard about doing a power pose a few minutes beforehand that it lowers your cortisol and it increases testosterone. So sort of standing like a superhero, if you will, taking up space um, helps you to feel more confident before an interview. And you can do all that uh, now before you have a remote interview. And if anxiety strikes, you can have a stress ball. I do not have one here, but that's also helpful. It's something you can do off screen. In the interview itself, let the interviewer lead. 
they can, it's their show. You don't have to feel like you're with any obligation to drive things forward. Do you have an elevator pitch? Doesn't have to be too well rehearsed. They talk about, you know, when they say, tell me about yourself, you know, it's coming. Feel free to pause. Don't fill every single gap. I know that that's hard. It's also hard when you're giving a talk like this to not fill gaps. So for what it's worth, I, I understand it's a challenge. And then ask your questions. All sorts of things. Time frame piece is one of them. Salary range is another. You can ask about decision-making processes. You can ask about um, team priorities. Anything, just ask. Then show some gratitude. You don't have to send a thank you note in the mail, um, but a quick email that is both sincere and authentic, I think goes a long way. You can resolve any outstanding questions that you might have. And last but not least, acknowledge the time and effort that they're putting into this. You are one of many people that they are talking to. And it's, it's really a challenge to hire a new teammate. I can say that um, as someone who has built her own team. This is, I think, my penultimate slide, the second to last one, I think. Be excited and enthusiastic with an offer, but always negotiate. Everyone expects it. Don't ever accept an offer out of the gate. Everybody on this webinar, please don't do that. Um, you can do this via phone or email. If you're someone who's more comfortable negotiating on the fly, phone is great, but you will need to prepare a little bit more. And remember that salary isn't the only item on the table. Your start date, whether you, what your budget is in a certain role, um, whether you have any, any one you can manage, uh, vacation days, flex time, there's a whole range of things. I can send you a list, be happy to. And emphasize your desire to work for them and be part of their team. So how can you contribute to this organization? Think about what a rock star you are um, and how you can put that forward in the context of, I can really help you. Okay, now you're ready. Um, thanks everyone for your time and attention for, the, for this past hour. It's been uh, wonderful to talk to you, but I'd like to hear your questions. Christy, this is great. Um, as I let some questions come in, which always take a second, I'm going to ask, what, well, first I'm going to say we do try to get students to do one page resumes, especially for internships. Mm -hmm. So, but I would say that if a person has more than that experience, we usually encourage them to share it. But sometimes our desire to get them down to one page is more like cutting out those things. Could you speak mm -hmm. on that a little bit? Because I mean, sometimes we see resumes of students and it's like they've listed every, every project they've been on. Like, I feel like LinkedIn is a place for that, but I think that sometimes in the resume, you do want to be able to show an employer that can get to the point. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to disagree with you on this, but I'd like to hear your opinion. I'm glad you're willing to disagree. Well, um, I meant like, because no, like, no, no. tell them that, you know what I mean? So I didn't mean like, a no, for statement. sure. They can have a two page one if they want, but we try and we, it, it's more about concision that we're trying to get them to, you know? Concision is critical. I think uh, everyone should think about their resume. Like it, it's showing off their greatest hits. So yeah. not every single project that you've done, but maybe one or two of the most impactful ones or the ones that you're proudest of that you would want to answer questions about. So. It's, it's definitely not about making it longer just to seem as if you're more experienced because anyone who has some experience can see through that on a resume pretty quickly. Awesome, yes, thank you for that was very succinct. Alyssa, I saw that you had your hand up and then I see that um, Ariel is next. So Alyssa, are you still, I see you took your hand down. So I wasn't sure if you took it up and then took it down. Oh no, I still have a question. Thanks okay, so much, great. Justina. All right, and it's so nice to meet you, Christy. I am a MAM alum. I graduated in 2020, so I did both remote school and remote work. And wow. I'm here today because I'm actually searching for my next opportunity and I needed the refresher and to be honest with you, the confidence boost as well. So thank you very much, first of all, for all of this information today. This has been absolutely stellar. I took a lot of pictures of the slides. I definitely plan to use a lot of it. So thank you so much. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So cool. Um, basically, I had a question regarding contacting somebody on LinkedIn. 
Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned giving before you get, and I was wondering if you could provide an example or two of what would be a meaningful give before uh, getting. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that it's going to differ based on the organization and maybe who you are, but for here's a small example. Um, maybe you come across research that you think would be useful to this person. Um, maybe it's a recent study that shows uh, customer perceptions about a certain thing or something along the lines of um, something from their industry. And maybe they've already seen it, but it's a way that you can sort of broach the conversation by saying, oh, so-and-so, I see that you're working in this. And I thought this might be of interest or this might really resonate with you. I was caught off guard by X, Y, or Z statistics in it. Would love to hear your thoughts. That's a way to start uh, a conversation. And if they're too busy, they will just politely, hopefully, um, shut you down and say, oh, thanks for this. You know, I've seen it already or I don't have time. But it could be a great way to open a conversation and make you look knowledgeable about the field as well. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think I've seen examples before of grants that might be available um, or mm -hmm. uh, say a webinar from the League of American Orchestra is one of those. Uh, that's Those actually just pop to mind. Okay, cool. Thanks so much. Yeah. Ariel, you're up. Hi, yep. I'm Ariel. I'm a meme uh, first year. Uh, just to kind of echo what Alyssa said, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for your time and energy today. Um, as this is my first year and I am one of those who've had more of a rockier start to just being in this digital world, mm -hmm. I was hoping to get a little bit more, like I guess, advice on one, how to be more efficient, like as an, in, like right now I'm a student obviously, and then I'm an intern for a um, media self start a media company out in Los Angeles. And so that's been cool, but it's also been a lot harder than I anticipated, just considering the fact that I'm here and they're there and lots of moving pieces. So mm -hmm. I guess just any other insights that you have for that. And then also um, how to really sell that as a transfer of transferable skills as I prepare for interviews on just what I'm taking in what I'm learning now and how I can like showcase that, that to me right now, it seems very practical. Like I feel like everyone is doing this, but I could be very wrong in, in terms of how to position yourself on being a remote worker. Mm -hmm. Okay, so great questions. Uh, the first one I will speak to and say, it's, it's hard when you, it's your first sort of gig or maybe it's one of your earliest professional gigs and you're remote. Um, if you find that you're struggling with it a bit, I would ask you some questions. Uh, I do this all the time. So I'll ask you questions to answer your question. Um, have you figured out the priorities for this particular role? If those are murky to you at all, something to talk with your manager about. Yes, so those have been figured out. They're constantly changing though, but getting a handle on how to think about the priorities that come on the, in the tray. Yeah, if they're constantly changing, maybe having a conversation about the fluid nature of them or having those priorities live somewhere virtually, uh, depending on what tools you're using. So that you ha don't feel like you're in the, you know, swimming upstream trying to figure out what's happening all the time. Um, that's another great way that you can stay in touch with the folks who are in California. Uh, in terms of efficiency, I, I think that I've had a, my own crash course in this over the past two years. Um, obviously I run a remote company, but I have a toddler now, so I can do more in 20 minutes than I used to be able to do in two hours. It is a superpower. Um, not saying everyone has to become a parent to tap into that, but knowing the priorities for your role and then being able to have your own to-do list every single day and know that you're not gonna get 10 things done. You might get the top three. Aim for those top three every single day and know what they are because if you don't, if you haven't identified them, the day is gonna melt away and everything will happen reactively instead of proactively. Uh, about positioning yourself. I actually don't think that everyone is saying, well, I was a remote, I, I was a remote grad student. And so therefore I am qualified to be a remote worker. And I'm not saying that you have to come right out of the gate and say that, but the transferable skills that you're getting in this particular internship, 
I think that you'll be able to draw out if you're doing any sort of like remote uh, negotiations. Um, I imagine you're doing collaboration of some kind, depends on the role itself. So taking the pieces of your current internship and making, making those appropriate for the roles that you're looking for. And I'd have to know more about the kinds of jobs that you're seeking to give you more detailed advice. But I really don't think that it's like a, a tired approach to talk about how you've, you essentially dove into this in the past year. And if you feel like you're sinking, I want you to know that you did this in circumstances that are not typical. This is not typical remote work territory. And everybody here has been um, doing the best that they can. And if hiring managers don't get that, you don't wanna work for that organization. Beautiful, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christy. So I just want to let everyone, I mean, we're going to lose a few people. It's one o'clock right now. But by my counts, we have three more questions that I actually think that we could get through if that's possible. Um, and, and maybe take us over just about 10 tops. This has just been fantastic. Christy, if you have 10 more minutes, we would welcome it if you could stay if the three people that have asked those questions can stay and we of course will be recording it. Is that okay with you, Christy? That is fine with me. Uh, if a pint-sized person comes in here uh, shouting, everyone just be patient. <laughs> we will, because we all know how to work from home now. So exactly. um, one of the questions that came in, in the, and, and then we'll go to Dylan, and then I believe it's Jayish, and then um, and we'll see if we can get to them all. But we may have to cut off if, if the answers take too long. But a question came in that a couple people had in the, in the, in the chat, and it was, there's some work that I've done in the MAM program that I'm really proud of. Um, mm -hmm. Is it okay to highlight those projects on LinkedIn or do school projects come off as amateur? I'll answer the second part of that. No, they do not come across as amateur. Actually, I think it's it's the absolute opposite of that. It's, it's so mature to take a project that you did in a grad program and deconstruct it. So there's a couple of ways that you could post about it. You could of course include it in your LinkedIn profile. But I think what would be more interesting is to write a LinkedIn post or an article, two different things. Um, article could live on your profile and you could have it in your featured section. For example, a post, you could also put that in your featured section. You can deconstruct the project. You could talk about challenges, um, what organizations you served, what you learned from it. And I think that that gives people a window into how you think as a professional, um, more so than I was a student and I did this project you're not approaching in a perfunctory way. You're showing um, real applicability of the things that you learned and why it mattered. So I, I don't think that that's, I, I think that's perfectly appropriate. Thank you, I agree. I mean, this has just been so good today. Again, I, uh, we still have about 35 people in the room. So a few people did have to leave, but Dylan, do you have hopefully maybe a quick question? Yeah, it, it was on your last slide um, about negotiations. I know yeah. a lot of us are applying for summer internships and a lot of us are looking for entry level work. So I'm mm -hmm. kind of interested to hear your thoughts on how to assess like the leverage or our positioning in a negotiation process. When I know that there's a list of candidates behind me that would crawl over my dead body uh, to take the position <laughs> I'm applying for, you know? Um, so how do I kind of assess the leverage that I can bring and then use that to negotiate an offer in a really competitive job market? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Um, also funny and sad at the same time. Thank you. Uh, I think that once you've gotten to the offer stage, you uh, clearly you've been selected from all of the rest of the candidates and uh, sure they could simply turn you down after you push back um, on, a, on an offer. But if a company does that, if they treat you like you're a commodity, that's not an organization that you want to work for. And I know that it's difficult because you feel like you don't have leverage as the applicant. You do bring, I mean, essentially you're the product they're buying. You bring your own unique skill set and training. So when I say you have to negotiate every single role, I'm not necessarily saying that you need to um, be focused on aiming for the moon, but I think that if you do some research in advance and figure out what the average is, um, in your area, you know, there are certain criteria that before you get loads of years of experience and can name your price, you have some anchors that you can bank on. Um, I would also say with, with regard to the entry level roles uh, 
and Jessica, I hope you don't get too mad at me for suggesting this. I tread with caution toward those, even if you have no job experience. Um, I don't know that with a graduate degree, you have to only consider, or that the bulk of the jobs you consider should be one to two years experience because your graduate degree, um, while it's not a direct replacement for professional experience, it places you in a different echelon from people who are coming straight out of undergrad to the workforce. I hope that was helpful. That was helpful and right on point, I, everything. I mean, like there's not been anything, everything you've said is just so helpful today. We have one last question. Um, Jayesh, I hope I'm not saying that too poorly. Uh, yeah, it's Jayesh. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, this question. So I wanted to ask is sometimes uh, we do have uh, some opportunity that we are currently in, but uh, we're looking to network with some people that uh, we might uh, have some use uh, later on, or we're just uh, building an amicable relationship. So uh, it happens many of the times that uh, we have sent a request to when we actually needed it, but mm -hmm. now we don't. So uh, I wanted to ask is uh, how to uh, maintain that relation uh, or uh, how to keep in touch in the uh, meeting terms so that it doesn't look like we're just approaching them when we actually need their help. Excellent question. Um, so this is this is part of why I advocate for building your networks now and not necessarily as part of the job search process. So it's not as if, oh, I found a job at this organization I, I love. Now let me go back and find who in that organization I can connect with. I've done that and people do do it, but it's better for you to be building that web early on. Um, and then later, if you find a job that's really of interest to you, someone might work there or they might know someone who works there. I think a way to keep those connections somewhat fresh and feel as if they're genuine, um, one way to do it is just sort of check in with people quarterly. So don't inundate people with DMs, but once a quarter, if somebody checks in with me on LinkedIn and says, oh, hey, Christy, you know, here's what I, I've been up to. Here's an update on the things that I've been doing in the past few months, quick update. Hey, I noticed you just gave this talk at CMU or whatever. Like find something to talk to them about and then you can keep that connection fresh and feeling like this is an authentic thing and not just you being opportunistic, looking to make a connection. Thank you. Yeah. That was a tough one. I didn't have that. That that was great. Well, we can stop the recording. And Christy, just thank you so much.